Hello, I'm Laura and this is Caitlin and we are co-organizers of Data Mishaps Night, which is a super fun event that we'll tell you about at the end of this. Um, and today is great. We're very excited to be here to hear all about the data successes, the wins and the impact that you all were able to make on your business through amazing data techniques. So we love coming to conferences like this to learn more about ways that we can improve our own data best practices, hear about what's new, and hear from all of you. Um, we think that's really great. Also, there's a lot that gets kind of lost on the conference stage, right? So there are a lot of projects that never really make it to this point. Like you make mistakes that are big enough that a project might fail entirely. There's also a lot that we don't see about the process. So while we're making our way from idea to implementation of a project, there are a lot of different ways where we could like spin out, for example, try things that don't work, or take really, really long ways and fail a little bit on the way to a success. And so we wanted to make some room to talk about those things. Um, we found that to be really important like to our careers, and so we wanna talk about data mistakes today. And we're going to do that starting with us. Yeah. So um, Laura had a really good Friday night. Do you want to tell them about it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so my Friday night, so I'm, I'm now a VP, so I've moved up in the leadership track. Um, thank you. Wow. Thank you. OK. Um, and which means, admittedly, I spend a little bit less time being technical than I would like to, though I still love it very, very much. And it's the beginning of the year, so our company is looking to have like all the dashboards made so we can track ourselves, right? And one of the things that we did was this engagement survey, which we did in a Google form. And as we're lining up our people able to make dashboards, there's just like no room for this. And I thought, I could do it. Like I still have some, I still have some skills, I can do this. I'll make us a little Tableau dashboard. Um, I can do that just in my spare time. That's problem number one, because I get the data and it's in a Google form, which if anybody works with Google Forms, it's not the best format. Um, that's okay. And then I call up my manager of data engineering and I say like, hey, can you sync this Google sheet to Snowflake? And I'm sorry, because I really, we have a problem with syncing Google sheets to Snowflake. If anybody does that, it's, it's a different kind of insanity. Um, but I do it. And then I get it into Tableau and I start making my analysis. Admittedly, again, the data isn't in a great format, but I'm just trying to do this quickly. So I'm like, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to have a whole pipeline around my Google form. I'm just going to make it work in Tableau. And essentially, I have 21 measures I need to display in seven categories. So I try to jam three measures into one viz but have them calculating individually. It's a bit difficult. I'm trying to navigate Tableau. It's been a while, but I get it to work and it looks great. It's so pretty. I feel great. I end the weekend. My friend who I did it as a favor for is so happy with me. I made it look beautiful. Everybody's happy. I end the weekend and I actually say to my husband, like, I still have it. Like, I did it. You know, and then that night I'm watching, uh, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish with my children um, with a glass of wine and I think, you know what, I'm gonna, I just made this. I didn't, I didn't take a moment to look at the results. Like now I just get to eat my cake, right? And so I go and I <laughs> look at the results and all of the seven different questions that have three metrics embedded in them are the same. Like it's literally the same graph repeated and if I had taken a minute to look at it, I would have known that. And now everybody who says thank you to me didn't notice that yet, and I'm like, okay, well, I guess over, over wine, while watching Puss in Boots, I will fix this. And it took me an hour and a half, and I was kicking myself. So that's my Friday. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty brutal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and from that, you know, because we talk about the lessons learned, from that I learned, like, it's good to take things as a favor, but make sure that you allocate the appropriate amount of time to actually you know, do it with the respect it deserves, because all analysis re deserves respect. Yeah. So how about you? Now I've shared mine. Tell me a little mistake of yours. Yeah, I'll tell you a little mistake. So uh, when I was a little baby data scientist, like 12 years ago, I built my first model. 
and I worked at a predictive analytics company largely with higher ed data. And so one of the things we were trying to predict is out of all of the students who were accepted in the uh, like fall or spring, who would actually show up and enroll at the school, right? And so it's really helpful to have those numbers. They can make all kinds of um, like headcount forecasts and understand how to make the budget. Um, important model for the school. And so I'm working on it and I'm jamming on exploratory analysis. I'm finding some good relationships. And when I get the accuracy of the model, it's looking amazing. And this is one of my early models, so I'm like, I really killed this. This is gonna be so good, I'm so excited. And so I presented it to the CEO of the company um, who liked to approve the work that was going out, especially from like the consulting arm. And I showed it to him and he was like, this is, this is way too high. Like this model doesn't make sense. There's no way this is accurate. This is impossibly accurate. It is too good to be true. And so we dig into the model a little bit and I was like, yeah, I included this really cool variable and it was called campus visit. And so it just tells us, did the person visit campus? Yes or no? And I was like, it's predictive. People who visited campus are much more likely to enroll. That, that makes a lot of sense, right? What I didn't know or didn't think to ask is there was no timestamp associated with the visit. So everyone who showed up for an admitted student's day <laughs> got flagged with that data and of course we were building it based on historical data and so we had no idea like when that flag flipped for people. And so we were making all these predictions that we thought were so good based on this data where it's like, yeah, if they're showing up to admit it's Students Day, there's 97% like chance that they're actually going to enroll. And so it was just kind of like a garbage variable. Uh, learned a lot about <laughs> digging in a little deeper into data sets and also the importance of timestamps and understanding like what comes first in an analysis. Yes. Yeah. Um, That's a good little whoopsie daisy. A little whoopsie daisy. Yeah. Any lapses in judgment? So many. Okay. So many. Um, one of the biggest lapses in judgment I made was in a prior position, we had an event streaming application um, where we would listen to events on Kafka, take them in, enrich, transform, send them on, right? And when we were designing this, the developer said, I want to make this in Erlang. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Which in hindsight is not good. So Erlang, sure, great for real-time event streaming, absolutely. One developer who knows Erlang writing a critical application, not a good idea. So the guy writes it in Erlang, it works very well, everything's great, until he's the only one who ever learns Erlang, he's the only one who can maintain it. It becomes our number one application for our event streaming application, and um, then he quits. And so that's fine. We started writing a second app to replace this, but not fast enough before eventually it did go down in production. And like those were dark days because <laughs> it went down. We all got on the call. Like I don't know how to co code in Erlang. Neither did anybody on that call. I, I, I searched people in our work directory for Erlang as a skill and I asked them to join. Nobody knew how to fix it. Uh, we tried fixing it for two days, that didn't work, and then eventually we just wrote the new application to replace it while the other one was down, and then deployed it. And so I learned from that that you know we want people to be happy, but we need to think about the bigger picture. Technology is cool, um, but it's all for the business purpose, and you should make sure you got a good plan. Yes. What, what about you? Come on, you've had some lapses in judgment. Don't make me feel crazy here. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a pretty good lesson, a pretty good set of lessons. Yeah. Um, another thing that happened recently, um, so I was principal data scientist at a growing startup, and we were in the e-learning space. So we're trying to understand who is completing lessons and work, and like how deeply are they engaging with our content, also so that we could give students credit for having done the work. So pretty important that professors understand who has done what. And so this started, as many good things do, with an exploratory data analysis. We saw some relationships and we're like, okay, maybe we can't make a one-size-fits-all judgment about how long it takes someone to complete this particular piece of content. So we found that like, students were getting through neuroscience uh, modules really quickly, but like cellular biology may be taking a little bit longer. And I presented the analysis. People thought it was really interesting, so interesting that they're like, let's just productionize this. Like, let's just put this in as our definition of done. Yeah. It's like, okay, we'll do that. 
And so we put together this pipeline and it instantly became a production pipeline. So this is something that was meant to be like an exploratory data analysis. We'll put this logic into a pipeline just to kind of see what we're getting for scores, see what students are doing. And then we put it in front of customers and it became um, a thing that customers really wanted to understand and dig into. And so this thing where I was like, I did this analysis, I am separate from the system. I basically built the walls around me to make myself a requirement <laughs> of the system. If anything ever came up where people had questions about this definition or needed to change the definition or anything like that, it all had to go through me. So I became, rather than like a single source of truth, like a single source of bottlenecking everything around this particular metric. And so I learned a lot of like really valuable um, lessons about just not productionizing things without thinking through like what the ownership cost of that is and making sure that people understand like what and why things are productionized, how to edit them and kind of building that pathway out once you've built the work so that you're not tied to it forever. Yeah. Yeah. So you like, you built yourself into a corner I basically. I did, yes. yeah. Okay. All right, now I have to talk about the oh snap moments. This is the moment where you're like, Am I gonna get fired? Am I going to face public embarrassment? Is my reputation completely gonna suffer? So I think um, when I was trying to dig deep for this one, um, a few years ago, right when COVID happened, we always have this huge in-person conference. Um, and it was our flagship conference and we decided right when COVID hit, it was like around that time, there was actually 47 days, I'll never forget it, until when that conference was gonna launch and we decided to go digital. And not only did we go digital, um, but we had to build the whole thing new. And then they put me as point person for analytics. And I was like, yes, I am going to go like full out on this. I'm going to make it rain data. Like this is the chance, you know, these people, they're in-person conferences. We're going to go digital. They're going to see what digital analytics looks like. We're going to rain data and I'm going to serve it on a silver platter. And I was so excited. And I'm telling you, like, we took this seriously. We had the whole thing, just end-to-end -end journey instrumented. I had a pre-game briefing. I had a during, like, a game day, all hours Zoom. You could drop in and ask questions about data, uh, post-game day briefing, all this stuff. And, you know, it's basically we're launching the thing on the same day that the data is streaming the first time from Prod as the same day that we're first analyzing it. And, you know, we're ready. And so that day goes on and the data streaming in and I'm like, you know, trying to get all my trends and totals and make sure that everybody knows them. And again, this is like very high stakes. Like our chief marketing officer at a very, very, very large company is asking for these numbers from me directly. And so I get the numbers. There was a bit of snags, had to kind of patch some things together, all good. I get the numbers, I give them, and not only, and I feel like as data people you'll get this, did I have the numbers, did I have the charts, but the numbers were good. Like they were really good. They were the numbers everybody wanted. And when we're data people, you can kind of feel like the weather man or woman where you're, you're saying like it's 80 degree and sunny and everybody loves you when it's nice and when it's raining, you're not very popular. But that day I was so popular because I had the numbers on the spot and the numbers were good. And I went, I left that day, everyone's giving me high fives. I'm like so happy with myself. Next day I come in because, you know, it's the second day of the conference and it's time to look at conversion rates. All right, I got this, like not a problem. We've planned for this. I go look at the conversion rates and the conversion rates are just awful. Like basically zero, right? And I'm going, oh no, what is happening? And what actually happened is the numbers I gave yesterday that were reported publicly were wrong. They were, they, we had an issue with our login where it duplicated user profiles, sometimes triplicated, sometimes quadrupled user profiles, and also didn't tie them to the authenticated user. And so I had day one, I was hero. Day two, I'm coming in with my conversion rates and I'm a zero and I'm wrong on day one. And that was like, I'm telling you, this is this is a flagship conference reporting to our CMO, and yeah, I wanted I wanted to cry. <laughs> Did um, you survive? I, you know, I hear it. I lived. I survived. And you know what? We actually ended up being able to patch all the data together. It was some long nights, um, but we we stuck to it. And I guess what I learned is like, if it's too good to be true, 
I think you said this earlier, it might be too, it might not be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's totally fair. <laughs> what about you, Caitlin? Yeah, um, so I worked at a company that was pretty new to experimentation. And I'd done some experimentation before, and so I was like, it, this is okay, I can walk you through it, I'm happy to help. And so we were experimenting with a new version of an algorithm, and we had like our A version and our B version, we wanted to roll it out to 50% of users to see which version of the algorithm was performing better, right? Like a very, very standard test. And so we're rolling it out, rolling it out, rolling it out, and I'm looking at the data, I'm reporting on the data, I'm seeing trends in the data, and I'm starting to tell people like, here's what's going on with the test, here's what's going on with the test. And we see some things that start looking like a little bit weird, like the number of people who are in the group that we're looking at is like a lot higher than it should be. Like if you think about 50% of the population, it's like, closer to 100% of the population. And so as we're digging in, digging in, digging in, trying to find out like what this could be, we eventually found out through a series of conversations that what we had actually run and reported very widely on was an AA test, <laughs> <laughs> where we rolled out the new version to everyone and thankfully none of the numbers tanked, so it was okay, no one got fired, it was, it was fine. Right. But we learned a lot of really valuable lessons about like having people in the room as you're designing tests and making sure that everyone understands what the test should be, how you should be setting it up, and the way that you're gonna analyze the data so that you don't have someone just rolling out a test to um, everybody. <laughs> yeah. And what could happen there. I think that's good, yeah. If we can't do experimentation, we can call it AA tests. Yeah, <laughs> and it's good to do <laughs> AA tests just to like make sure that everything is working okay. Yeah. Just not when you don't mean to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this slide here is just, how did Caitlin and I get started talking about data mistakes? During the coronavirus, the two of us were just looking to escape the house, try to find a healthy way of, you know, just having human contact. And we would go for these long hikes and we would talk about everything. Talk about everything related to data, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we found ourselves talking about data mistakes a lot and normalizing them between us. And that's really where we had the epiphany, like, why don't we hear more stories about this? We should talk about this because data mistakes are such an important part of our learning journey. And so in the next two slides, we're just gonna talk a little bit about what we've learned about mistakes. Yeah. So a couple of things about making and learning data mistakes. Like we think it's really important to acknowledge that everyone is going to have both failures and successes and sometimes maybe even more failures as you're trying new approaches than successes. And that's actually a good thing, that's really healthy. Like if we only do the things we know how to do, we don't learn and grow. And so trying new things can invite failure, that's okay, it's all good. Um, how we react to failure is one of the biggest predictors of future success. And so if you can become resilient, if you can not let your mistakes but, um, define you but start to grow from them, you can learn and grow in new directions and that's really healthy behavior, it's something that we want to encourage. And then finally, like our experience is the sum of both our successes and failures. And so like one thing that Laura and I can be sure of is like we're not gonna mistake, make those mistakes again. Like maybe we'll make new ones, hopefully they're more interesting, but if the goal is just make new mistakes while learning from the old ones, I think that's really healthy and it's a really good sign that you're actually building real experience, some of which can be very hard earned and that can be a good thing. And so there's a lot of space for us to like talk about this and really acknowledge the importance of mistakes. Yeah. All right, and why it's important to share your data mistakes. Um, I'm just gonna switch you spots here yeah. just because I can see better. So when you share mistakes and your lessons learned, it might seem like, ah, oh, we don't have time for this in our sprint, but it actually does speed up your development cycle. Because the thing about data is that we fail silently, right? Unlike other software engineer where the actual app will go down or whatever, in data we present a piece of truth and it might actually be a silent failure. And so it's important that we set aside time for people to understand like we do make mistakes. Communication around understanding is paramount so that we can have these better conversations and people aren't spinning their wheels silently. Also, it's important to share your mistakes or any sort of um, issues that you're having with your stakeholders. Sometimes that's hard to do, right? Because we want them to think everything we're doing is perfect, but like, here's the secret. They don't think you're perfect. Everybody knows that we all make mistakes, so if you cop up to a few of them, they'll probably have more trust in you. And then finally, sharing mistakes can help to reduce imposter syndrome within the community. 
So oftentimes there's imposter syndrome for people who are new to the community, but what I like to think of is like we're ideally, we are always new to something. Like I am always new to something. You are always new to something. Therefore, we're always facing new confusion and making new mistakes. And that is just like a general trend of learning and growing. Mm -hmm. And so that brings us to Data Mishaps Night. This is the event that we co-founded. Um, so there's some information about it up on the screen. It's happening this Thursday. It's at 7 o'clock Central. It's on Zoom. We have a killer keynote. Ben Stansel is the chief analytics officer at Mode. Um, he puts out ben.substack. It's a really good tech newsletter um, if you're interested in learning about like the analytics space and some of the players there. Um, we also have 13 killer speakers. So we got a lot of submissions. We picked the mistakes that we think were most interested and most representative of like what we're seeing for trends in the field. <laughs> this is the third year we've done this event and it feels like a party. Like we're wrapping up the end of the conference, end of the day, right? We're all, all about to go to cocktail hour. These are the stories that we usually hear at cocktail hour and we're just bringing that to the main stage of an event. Yeah, perfect. What I miss. So, <laughs> What do you need to do? Go to datamishapsnight.com. Sign up soon because we're sending out the information in the next day or so. Um, and also talk to us if you're interested. Mm -hmm. And we've got some hex stickers that we'll put somewhere for people to get. So we've got some Data Mishaps Night hex stickers that we're giving away. We'll just find a little table. Yes, there. Perfect. Awesome. They're very cute little icon. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, it's a party. Like, yeah. join us. It'll be really fun. You'll learn a lot. You'll get to hear from a lot of like senior people talking about some things that they've done wrong and maybe some regrets and maybe what they would do better. It's really good stuff. Yeah. Thank cool. You. Thank you. Oh, we have questions. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Great talk. Love it, as always. Uh, so I have two questions, uh, and they kind of are similar but in different directions. How do you, like in these kind of mistakes, how do you manage up and manage down? I think you talk about like individual, uh, but now you're all both leaders, so how do you share that experience with people that you're leading? Um, in an efficient way, and also like the CMO example, like how did you make them trust you again? <laughs> right? I feel like it's a double-edged sword, uh, so I'm interested in that part of our. Do you want to go first? Uh, I'll Do take it. I'll yeah. take the first crack. <laughs> Um, so I think, I think it's not just about like, oh my gosh, I make this mistake and laying it at their feet, right? Yeah. But it is about saying, here's what happened, here's how we're remedying it, here's what they need to know, right? So, so in my case, it was like, here's what happened, it was because of this defect, this is the actual numbers, and here's when the fix will be deployed, and you'll get your new numbers. And I mean, you just have to, you just have to do it, and, but I think the most important thing is being uh, clear, transparent about the why, and the what next. Yeah. yeah. I would I would echo all of that. And so um, like being clear, coming to people quickly and letting them know um, like here's what's wrong, here's what's gonna fix it, setting expectations appropriately is a really good thing whenever anything goes wrong. And then you asked about um, like teammates, right? And so I'm like in a senior IC position. And so people look up to me, people learn from me. I try to be really forthcoming about my mistakes and also just share them to make people feel comfortable. Like if they share that they've made a mistake or that they're worried about something, I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, like you're about to learn the best thing. If you've ever seen the XKCD, that's like you're one of today's lucky 10,000. It's like rather than saying like, oh, you don't know this thing, like what a bummer, how do you not know that? It's just being like, oh, you get to learn this really valuable lesson. It's gonna stick with you for your career and like you just earned it, like good. I think there's a really positive spin that you can put on yeah. all of this and then also just like being transparent with people is helpful and that's the way I would want people to treat me and so there's a little bit of like golden rule vibe in there too. Yeah, I'll add to that too. I think um, one thing that one of my managers has said to me in the past is like, we're not gonna let you fail. You may fall down, you may get a scar, you may always remember that fall, but we're not gonna let you fail. And like it's those little scars that add up 
to your baseline level of knowledge, which is what Caitlin had mentioned before.